Chinese Paintings of Beautiful Women, Part 1. This video lecture, which will be a long one in two parts, will more or less follow an essay that I've written for publication in the catalog of a forthcoming exhibition that Julia White, the Asian art curator at our Berkeley Art Museum, and I have organized titled Beauty Revealed, Images of Women in Qing Dynasty Chinese Painting. Uh, because this exhibition and its catalog represent the culmination of a project that I've been engaged in over many years, my introductory essay for the catalog begins by t tracing how that project originated and how it developed over 40-some years. The paintings in the exhibition will all, of course, be reproduced in the catalog along with some others that were, we were unable to borrow. But a video lecture offers even richer opportunities for lavish showing of images in color and sometimes with details. And I'll take advantage of all those opportunities. I mean also to have separately another and perhaps longer essay on images of women in later Chinese painting, based in large part on the series of lectures that I gave at the University of Southern California in 1994, the Getty Lectures, which were never published except in digital form on my website. My catalog essay begins with acknowledgments to all the people who have helped, uh, be beginning, of course, with Julia White. Uh, here's a photo of her, uh, image of Julia and the two of us working together. It will be followed by two images of us working together, choosing paintings for our exhibition. My catalog essay continues with uh, this. Now that we have arrived at last at a stage of near completion of our years-long project, and the lovely women themselves will soon be looking provocatively out at us from their images hanging on our museum walls, it seems time for me to, as the oldest participant in this project, to look back retrospectively over the 40-plus years since the time when uh, th I, this, in the same museum in 1971 it all began. I had organized with a seminar of eight remarkable grad students, all women, and one of them my successor at UC Berkeley, now Professor Patricia Berger, next. We had organized an exhibition titled The Restless Landscape, Chinese Painting of the Late Ming Period. This was a first in many ways, a uh, first exhibition held in our new museum with the participation of a graduate seminar group, first exhibition of late Ming painting, and so forth. Among the eight students in the seminar, all young women, besides Pat Berger, who had just arrived from study at Cornell, there was Marshall Widener, next, who had just entered the program, coming from Mills College in Oakland, and who would write the first essay ever on the position of Chinese landscape painting in Chinese social history, as Pat Berger had written another first on the same in political history, next. My colleague and friend in the history department, Fred Wakeman, now alas the late Fred Wakeman since he died of illness some years ago, took part in our seminar and gave useful guidance to the students on matters that were outside my own competence. Next. Among the paintings we borrowed for, for our exhibition was a painting of a beautiful woman, now in the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard, and unfortunately unborrowable for our present show. We had seen this painting on our East Coast trip to view and choose pieces to include. It had just been purchased for the fog on the recommendation of my old teacher, Max Lohr, who was still teaching there. He had discovered it. A small inscription of two lines in the lower left corner informs us, or misinforms us, as it turned out, that the painting was done in 1643 by an artist named Wu Zhuo, and is a portrait of a famous woman poet, Liu Yin, or to use the name in the inscription, Madame Hedong, Hedong Furan. Uh, we published it in our catalog where it was written up by, next, by Li Yu, or Stella Li, another newly arrived student, a little known doctoral candidate like the others then, but now, many years later, a famous and distinguished literary figure. Here is the cover of a Taiwan literary magazine featuring an article by her with her photograph on it. She took on the task of writing about late Ming figure painting so that the Madame Hodung painting was hers to publish for the first time. Next. 
once introduced in this way, Madame Hadoun, that's in quotation marks, went on to become for a time everybody's favorite woman in Chinese painting. A younger colleague published an article about her as an image of, as he put it, the liberated woman in China. A grad student, who's now one of our leading younger specialists, made her the subject of a master's thesis and so forth. I myself, meanwhile, had come to doubt her credentials. Next. She represented a new area of subject matter within Chinese painting studies. In the 1950s, when I was myself a student working toward my doctorate, and I was still that when I published my scarab book, Chinese Painting, in 1960, no one would have thought of including beautiful women pictures in the selection of works to be reproduced. Paintings of women were reproduced or discussed only if they were of some age and with prominent attributions. Next. One of the illustrations in my book reproduced, for instance, a painting of palace ladies playing double sixes. That's a game, uh, in the uh, board game, in a painting in the Freer Gallery of Art where I was a curator. Copied after a work by the Tang period master Zhou Feng, a specialist in this subject. My 1967 exhibition, titled Fantastics and Eccentrics in Chinese Painting, was not shown at the University Art Museum, as it was then called, because it hadn't yet opened, but it was at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. No proper meiran were included. Images of women were in some of the paintings, but as parts of the imagery in works valued for their authorship and individualist style. For instance, next please. The two young women in a painting by the great late Ming master Chen Hongshou, his scholar teaching girl students, now in the collection of the Berkeley Art Museum. Paintings of beautiful women as a separate genre uh, were still unrecognized and unstudied. Now back to the Madame Hodong painting that started it all. Next. After a time, other paintings that were disturbingly similar to Madame Hodong began to come to my attention such as the one to, in this one in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, now on screen. Paintings that were not portraits at all, but generic pictures of beautiful women. In other words, Mehran paintings. And my suspicions were proven correct when another younger colleague, Jerome Silbergelt, brought to my attention, next please, a picture reproduced in an old journal, another version of the same composition the hole from which the false Madame Hadung had been cut down. This one owned by a dealer in Paris and provided with another false inscription, making her out to be a self-portrait of a famous courtesan artist. The existence of the picture in two versions eliminated the possibility of either one being a true portrait, and the appearance of more and more similar pictures gradually opened up for me a new genre and a new subject for investigation within my field of study. Next. I also searched for and eventually tracked down in an old poor reproduction a real portrait of Liu Yin, seated outdoors on a platform, both feet on the ground, looking very unsexy, but portrayed the way that the real person would have chosen to be portrayed once she had become a famous literary woman. And searching further, I discovered another portrait of Liu Yin, or Madame Hadong. Uh, shown dressed as a male scholar, as she was when she came to the famous scholar official Chen Shen Yi to become his student and his mistress. I built around these highly dissimilar paintings, the so-called Madame Hudung that had been in our exhibition, and the real portraits of this famous woman, Yu Yin, that I discovered in old reproduction books. I built a lecture titled The Real Madame Hudung which I went around giving wherever I was invited to lecture for several years. Next. In 1978, I gave this lecture at Harvard to the great distress of Max Lohr, who saw his prized discovery much reduced in social status. I was sorry about that, but excited by the opening up of this new unexplored genre. Paintings of women, when noticed at all by Chinese writers, had been lumped together in the general category of shen yu hua, or gentlewomen paintings. As I put it at that time, we were all, collectively, still incapable 
of telling the portraits from the pinups. Next. By 1988, I was traveling around China giving a lecture titled Pictures and Portraits of Women in Chinese Painting to a very mixed reception. Younger scholars greeted it with great interest. Older ones were inclined to question my discoveries about the sexual iconography used in Mayuran paintings, for instance, which I was beginning to decipher. They argued that my observations about these had no sound basis, since they were derived only from looking at the paintings themselves. No references to them could be found in the Chinese literature, the written sources that were the only evidence they trusted. I pointed out, for instance, that the finger citron, or Buddha's hand fruit, which appears frequently in these paintings, was a conventional symbol or displacement for the female genitalia. A book on erotic art of Asia by Philip Rawson, titled Erotic Art of the East, had identified certain images of peaches of the Buddha's hand fruit, uh, others, as having that significance. My text reading colleagues, however, demanded more. But I went on collecting images and working on reading them undeterred. Next. In the early 1990s, all this new material and my tentative readings of it were cohering sufficiently that I was able to present in fall 1993 an undergraduate seminar, one that was attended, fortunately for me, by several advanced grad students who made important contributions to our collective study. One of these, and my research assistant all through the project, was a truly remarkable grad student named Andrea Goldman, then a major in com comparative literature, who among her accomplishments could sing Chinese opera or engage in that kind of fast-talking pinghua, I think it's called, comic repartee uh, that Chinese professional entertainers perform. She used to perform it at the Center for Chinese Studies New Year's parties, uh, too much acclaim. Here she is in her marriage photo with her mother. I've always felt that her Jewish heritage and a prob probably an upbringing in a talkative family must have started her off on these unusual abilities. Next. And here she is alone on the seashore. She is now a professor herself in the history department at UCLA. The assistance that she gave to me was far-reaching and invaluable. Next. That seminar, in turn, became the basis for a series of five lectures, the Getty Lectures, which I delivered at the University of Southern California in 1994 as The Flower and the Mirror, Representations of Women in Late Chinese Painting. These are repeated in Berkeley and again for large audiences in New York at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I meant to publish these as a book, but never quite found the time to carry out all the work that would, have, that would have entailed. And the Getty Lectures have been available only on my website, jamescahill.info, under the title, Women in Chinese Painting, in the section of my website titled, Writings of James Cahill. An outgrowth of one of those lectures, however, in which I tried to determine what kind of artist painted these pictures and when and where, was much expanded and turned first into a new lecture, ponderously titled, A Neglected Current in Middle Cheng Painting, colon, Works uh, in the Semi-Westernized Academic Mode by Urban Professional Artists. Oof, who would come to a lecture titled like that? Anyway, they did. And then it was further expanded into a separate book, published in 2010 as Pictures for Use and Pleasure, Vernacular Painting in High Qing China in which, especially in the fifth and last chapter, I also addressed such large questions as how changing attitudes toward women in China are reflected in these paintings. Next. This is a Mehran painting by one of these urban studio artists, the Yangzhou master Zhang Jun, a work now belonging to the Berkeley Art Museum and in our show, seen here in two images, the one at left taken from the painting itself the one at right from the reproduction in my book. The painting turned up in an auction catalog and led me onto a new line of investigation, how the works of these Jiangnan or Yangtze Delta region small masters, the urban professional artists of my lecture title, 
were appreciated in the Manchu court in Beijing. Zhang Jun, who began as one of these, was invited to serve as a court artist in Beijing under the Kangxi Emperor in the early Qing, and was probably responsible, perhaps along with his son, who also served in the academy, for, next please, the famous series of 12 Beauties, now in the Palace Museum in Beijing. I reproduce one of those beside it in my book. Uh, note the similarities in the woman's face, faces, in the uh, composition, in the depiction of the two cats. Uh, the whole set of 12 has had a lot written about it, some of it arguing about why there are 12 paintings, citing old sets of 12 poems, etc. But the simple truth of it, I think, is that these were originally mounted on a pair of six-fold screens. As Michael Baxendall uh, used to argue, the simpler explanations are usually the right ones. Next. Another that I reproduced in my book was the painting Women, Woman in a Brothel Presented to a Client, which I knew then only from an old photograph that I'd acquired during my time at the Freer Gallery of Art. The painting had been offered for sale by a Shanghai dealer named Strayonet in the 1920s and was wrongly ascribed to the great Ming master Tong Yin. I used it in my various lectures and writings on painting of women in China and reproduced it in my book, little suspecting that this painting would not only turn up in the hands of a dealer, but would be acquired by our museum and be included in our exhibition. It turns out to be unexpectedly rich in color and in finely painted fabric designs, and in the women's robes and in the rug. Notice also the latticework patterns on the opening in the wall above them, and the display case with objects. This is one of the attractions of many Mayoran paintings, the sheer pleasures of visual richness that they offer. Next. As I explain the sexual iconography of the pictures, depending somewhat on Chinese love poetry and learned writings about it, I began to recognize hidden allusions to sexual imagery in outwardly innocent images. The woman holding out her sleeve in this way, allowing the male to gaze into it, is an invitation to enter her private parts. Here, for instance, is a painting of the early 19th century in which the young woman is out seeking the first blossoming plum trees in early spring symbolic of male rejuvenation. And she holds one of these in such a way that it penetrates her open sleeve. Pictures that had looked conventional gradually came to appear charged with sexual meaning. Next. But they can afford visual pleasures quite apart from any sexual symbolism. This anonymous picture of a woman gazing into a, a pond with fish, which will be included in our show, is another fine example of a work that richly repays close looking into the splendid, splendid patterns on the woman's robe. She stands on the edge of a fish pond looking down at the fish. If there is any sexual symbolism in this, I'm not clearly aware of it, although I suspect there probably will be. Uh, the painting is owned by a dealer and somewhat too expensive for us to buy, but we'll be happy if someone will buy it for us. Ha! Ah. The fact that these paintings are mostly on silk and that silk darkens with age means that the casual gallery goer may miss these attractions of the paintings by not taking time to gaze into them for extended stretches of time, as I strongly recommend to my, in my catalog essay that uh, viewers of our exhibition do. Next. As for the may run from the British Museum, an anonymous work with spurious seals of the 18th century master Lung Mei. Uh, this is one of the finest surviving Mayoran paintings, and we're fortunate in being able to include it in our exhibition. The woman has been seen and described as a gentlewoman, but like the false Madame Hodung, she belongs in that ambiguous and fluid status of the courtesan uh, concubine. Uh, one can go from one to the other and back easily. Uh, her inward look, as though she is contemplating something she had just read, suggests that she's a woman of intellectual stature. And indeed, some of the women in this situation in the late Ming and early Qing were learned and talented, 
as was Liu Yin herself. Next. In my catalog essay, I admonish the visitors to our exhibition, after you have spent enough time admiring the cool elegance of this wonderful picture, move in close to see, for instance, how the artist has treated the edges of the book she is reading and the others beside her, observing and showing, uh, showing us exactly how the outer edges of Chinese books expose the marks printed across their folds. Next. Continuing to pursue Meiran paintings in my movements around the world, I discovered among the neglected paintings in the Shanghai Museum a fine and important painting of a woman in a weedy garden, never exhibited or photographed, and scarcely noticed, and on it the seal of Yu Ding, who was active in the late 18th century, first in Yangzhou and then in Beijing. Uh, her downcast face, her harsh surroundings, identify her as a woman too long neglected, a type common in China, where merchants and officials were often absent from their families for long periods. Bringing together a group of such paintings enabled a preliminary typology of, quote, waiting women pictures that make up a large part of the genre, the pictures of depictions of women waiting for their lovers to come. The male viewer can take on an imagination the role of the man that she's waiting for. In this detail, we see what she is gazing at, three rabbits on the ground, which somehow remind her of her husband or lover. Women in these pictures are often shown as gazing at coupling dogs or cats, or even pairs of butterflies. Uh, why are there three instead of two? We can only speculate. The darker one, presumably uh, the male, watches the two white ones, female, as they wrestle playfully. Next. I reproduced beside it, as so closely similar in style that it would appear to be by the same artist, a painting in the National Palace Museum in Taipei that has been catalogued as Anonymous Ming, but can now be credited, I believe, to the same Yu Ding. This, by contrast, is a woman happy in love, reading a book of love poetry, sitting comfortably in a garden with flowers instead of weeds, and with her a cat, a bird, and a butterfly. These could originally have been a pair representing unrequited versus fulfilled love. Next. The Yu Ding painting in the Shanghai Museum was not available for our exhibition, but a painting of a similar theme by Yu Ding's contemporary Gu Zhenlong, his Lady in a Garden, dated 1683, is not only included, but is permanently in the Berkeley Bart Museum. Earlier it was my own. I saw a small reproduction of it in a magazine, contacted the dealer who had it for sale, purchased it for myself, and later gave it to the BAM. This is another woman, too long left to herself, uh, the gnarled and vine-hung tree in her garden, the harshly shaped rocks tell of her neglected state. Her face is more ambiguous still with a slight smile of welcome. Nothing done by Gu Zhenlong is ever simple. Gu was a prolific and highly versatile early Qing master who was active in Suzhou, but also for a period at the imperial court in Beijing. He has figured heavily in my studies over the years as I found more and more work signed by him or attributable, attributable to him by style that are important additions to my growing body of materials. Next. This small painting of a Meiran leaning on a blossoming tree, painted in ink on paper by the major 18th century Yangzhou master Luo Ping, is another in our show that was formerly my own and is now in the BAM. I purchased it in Taipei long ago, very cheap, after seeing it at a dealer shop and asking Wang Ji Chen, or Xi Xi Wang, who was with me, is this a real Luo Ping? He told me that it was quite genuine, a kind of minor work that the artist might paint quickly to pay some kind of small debt, such as his lunch bill. Next. Back to Gu Zhenlong and the big role that he has played in my research. I attributed to him, on the basis of style, a series of large album leaves illustrating the erotic novel Jinping Mei, probably done while he was at court. One painting from it, a scene in a brothel, seen here, 
with a mayor on painting hanging on the far wall, will serve to introduce another line of pursuit that I undertook, to try to determine from both literary and pictorial evidence where these paintings were hung. They took on different characteristics according to whether they were intended for men's rooms or women's, besides, of course, changing in character with the passage of time, earlier ones different from later ones, that is. Next. Here's another painting by Gu Zhenlong, a leaf in an album that I know only from an old publication, a uh, scene in a woman's bedroom, with a painting hanging on the far wall, a painting that can be identified from similar examples as representing the nymph of the Law River, floating above the river. My findings on these uh, matters were published in a 1998 article titled, Where Did the Nymph Hang? X question mark. And were repeated, of course, in my vernacular painting book, Pictures for Use and Pleasure, in which I managed to publish most of the uh, fruits of my research on this fascinating subject up to this time. Next. In the last chapter of that book, I made, I made a first attempt at setting forth a chronological account of the development of the Meiran genre, an attempt that in some part was in, has inspired our exhibition. And I tried with the sequence of paintings reproduced there as examples to establish in a preliminary way a developmental pattern for this genre of painting. One of the paintings I reproduce and discuss there a work painted in 1640 by an artist named Huang Shifu, and titled A Fairy Beauty at Rest, is an especially early and important example of Meiran painting. It portrays one of the concubines of Huang's patron sitting on a garden rock and striking a beguiling pose. This attractive painting, strongly erotic, with the translucence of her upper garment revealing her body, and her winsome gesture of touching her lips with her little finger, unfortunately could not be included in our show. It's in the Palace Museum in Beijing. Next. Here is one from the old collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art that I used as a stand-in for a mayor on paintings that's described in a novel as hanging in a man's room. I put it on to give you something to look at while I make some more observations about these paintings. Being first wrong and then right about Madame Hodong, as related earlier, and seeking out and identifying her sisters, brought home to me several important truths about these paintings. First, that many of them, along with others of what I call collectively vernacular paintings, because they were not in themselves the kinds of things that dealers could sell and collectors wanted to own, uh, they've, they've, re they've survived only through being furnished with false signatures or attributions and wrong identifications of subject, it's, uh, aimed at make, turning them from undesirable merchandise into desirable. And that these misleading accretions need to be stripped away uh, before the paintings can be considered for what they really are. And second, that the proper Chinese literature on painting is virtually devoid of information about them. One must search in Chinese fiction for descriptions of them, hanging on walls, or including the, uh, the walls of women's bedrooms, or stories of how the beauties in them come to life and emerge to gratify their adoring male viewers, or the occasional jottings called Shui for stories about the urban artists who produced them, who sometimes lived in the pleasure districts of cities and experienced their attractions firsthand. Next. In my Getty lectures, I attempted a kind of outline history of the genre, citing literary references or showing actual examples of the kinds of paintings of women that led up to the full emergence of the Meiran as a distinct genre in the late Ming and early Qing the 17th century. I cited a literary reference from an early Song, that is 10th century text, about a painter in the southwest province of Shu, present-day Sichuan, who specialized in paintings of beautiful women, and how merchants from the Jiangnan or Yangtze Delta region bought these to take back and sell to their customers back home. What these paintings looked like we can't say, 
No paintings of this kind from so early a date survive. I show here the well-known painting of women in a garden, probably late Tongan date, in the Liaoning Museum, a painting I showed at length in one of my, one of my video lectures in the first series. Next. We have numerous paintings from the Song Dynasty that feature women as their main subjects, such as this fan painting, but always with the women in some setting, not portrayed as subjects in themselves. Next. It's not until the middle Ming period, the 15th and 16th centuries in our calendar, that we can observe Mayoran paintings of the kind we know uh, seeming to emerge. This famous and prolific Suzhou artist, Chu Ying, painted beautiful women in outdoor settings, as in these two examples. One at the left of a woman in a landscape, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in two versions, actually, and the one at right in the Shanghai Museum, uh, which depicts a woman gazing across a stream at a pair of mandarin ducks dreaming of her absent husband. These are not properly Meiran, and they belong rather to a, in a lecture on women in Chinese painting that I'll do, prepare at a later date. Next. Another painting by Chu Ying, also showing the woman outdoors, represents a palace lady in a garden attended by a eunuch. She reaches up to arrange her hair as if anticipating meeting the emperor or some other high-ranking male who will appreciate her beauty. Chu Ying here follows an early tradition of making the woman plump Court ladies in the Tang Dynasty were said to be plump, following a fashion in some part inspired by the fame of Yang Fei, who was that way. Next. Chu Ying, contemporary Tang Yin, who had a reputation as something of a womanizer himself, made paintings of beautiful women as one of his specialties. Here are two by him, one standing and holding out the, the sash of her girdle, as if saying, here I am, just pull the string. And another painted in 1520, in which the woman is playing a flute, a motif with clear erotic implications that I won't spell out, but I think you can guess. Next. Their contemporary Du Jin, active in Nanjing, also painted beautiful women. This work in the old Freer collection, which I've attributed to him on the basis of style, represents a woman inscribing an autumn leaf, a reference to an old story in which the woman confined to the palace communicated with her lover in this way, floating out the inscribed leaves on a stream that ran beneath the palace wall. Uh, this is all discussed in my, uh, in my uh, Getty lectures. Anyway, these are mostly not yet what we could call pure Meiran. They are likely to have literary or historical themes and often portray the women in outdoor settings. Next. A good example of this outdoor type, which I've often used in my lectures, is this painting done in 1642, late Ming, by the Suzhou master Shun Chigong, representing a woman picking mulberry leaves and gazing down at two puppies uh, playing, which remind her of her lover, or perhaps of her longing for, for, for a lover. Pictures of women seen through a window represent a kind of transitional type popular in the late Ming and early Qing. Here are two examples, one left by a minor Yangzhou master named Yin Shi, uh, a painting reproduced in the second chapter of my Pictures for Use and Pleasure book, and another that I can't identify. Next. Paintings of the woman seen through a window, a type that I discuss at length with examples in one of my Getty lectures, give the viewer the voyeuristic pleasure of spying on the woman when she is unaware of being seen, as a male voyeur might do, standing outside her house. These two are both by the 18th century master Hua Yen, active mainly in Yangzhou, and they are both copied from old reproductions. I don't know the originals. Next. Two fine examples are in our exhibition, the one by the Yangzhou artist Zhang Jun, which I showed earlier, and one from the Chicago Art Institute with a false inscription of the major 18th century master Lung Mei. This latter work may in fact be earlier than Lung Mei in his time, and it's closer in style to Gu Zhen Lung, active earlier in the Qing. Why the woman has exposed herself in this way 
and what she contemplates doing is left to our imaginations, but the voyeuristic mode of presentation pushes us, at least us males, toward an erotic reading. In my Getty lectures, I cited writings by feminist writers uh, on voyeurism and the male gaze. Next. The fully developed type, in which the woman is seen as if through an open door into her boudoir, looking out and seeming to welcome the viewer in, doesn't appear until the middle Cheng period, well into the 18th century, or perhaps a bit earlier. I know of two examples that could be earlier than that, in which the woman is, woman is seen in her boudoir, but not looking out at us, rather absorbed in her own occupations. In one of these, a signed work by the artist Zhao Bing Zhan, who is best known for works done during his service in the Qing Imperial Court, but who also painted outside the court, one of them is this fine painting, which I know only from reproductions. It appeared in an auction catalog, and I got a good image and permission from the auction company. It's plate 3.19 in my Pictures for Use and Pleasure book. She is seen arranging flowers in a vase. Next. The other is this painting by Yu Ding, Yangzhou master who spent some of his later life in Beijing. It's dated 1697 and thus supplies one of the monuments for the genre. It's reproduced as figure 5.18 in my book and discussed at some length there. It's another waiting woman picture in which the woman is seen sitting in her boudoir at a Wei Qi board, preparing to play with her lover when he comes, as a uh, diversion before lovemaking. I discuss it at some length in my book, pointing out, that the, pointing out the skilled use of shadowy spaces and other techniques that he's learned from European pictures. The painting is in the Tianjin Museum and unfortunately couldn't be borrowed for our exhibition. The next. The sequential series that I'm offering here, in fact, in fast order, is presented in my book with the same paintings and others and discussed more fully in order to establish a kind of development of the Meiran type over the centuries, the implications of these successive types and their probable effect on male viewers are discussed there at greater length than I can do here. Basically, I see it as a process of heating up increasing over time the erotic appeal of the paintings for male gazers. Next. It reaches a high point in paintings like the one reproduced in my book as figure 521, a work by another major figure, master of the time, who painted both inside and outside the Imperial Academy, that is Lung Mei. It's dated to 1724 and it's in the Tianjin Museum, another that was unfortunately unborrowable. The woman is shown in her boudoir, gazing provocatively out at the viewer and thrusting a rolled up book, a book of love poetry, into the space the artist has hollowed out in the region of her groin. Uh, one could scarcely be more explicit than this, but all this sexual iconography, as I call it, which must have been fairly fully readable by people of the time, has gone unexplored by scholarship afterwards until this one foreigner, myself, broke the taboos and began collecting the paintings and looking at them uh, long and hard and studying them. Next. Lung Mei's inscription, written in the upper left as if on a painting in the room, says that he painted this one while lodging at the Lu Canal Bridge, something like that. Uh, these inscriptions will be valuable for people studying the career of Lung Mei. There's already quite a literature on this. He was serving in the academy in 1724, but he must have also been producing some paintings, paintings for sale outside it. Next. That Lung Mei work in the Tianjin Museum cannot be in our exhibition, but we're fortunate to be able to include another similar painting by the same artist, this one dated 1721. The compositions of the two are alike in many ways so alike as to confirm the authenticity of both. They are probably two survivors from a large number of pictures of this kind that he did. Lung Mei was an extraordinarily productive artist and working both inside and outside the imperial court.
but he probably also had a group of studio masters working with him to produce fine paintings that he could sign or that he could be furnished with his signature. The great mass of paintings by or attributed to him makes up more a type than a proper oeuvre. The, name had, the same had been true of Chu Ying in the Ming Dynasty, whose name appears on thousands of paintings that he didn't, did, are not really from his hand. But Lung Mei must have devised the compositions and otherwise overseen the production of these paintings, besides doing, of course, many of them himself. Details match up in these two. The root wood stand seen in both, for instance, is virtually identical, no doubt a real existing piece of furniture that the artist portrayed faithfully in both pictures. Next. The woman in one of these Lung Mei paintings holds a rolled up book the other is reading one. At least one of these books shows readable text, and it may be possible to identify the book, as was the case in a painting in the old Freer Gallery collection by some artist close to Lung Mei. The title of the book is legible, and it means something like boudoir poems, that is, love poems. Reading these collections of love poetry is one of the ways that women waiting in their boudoirs spend their time. The reading and the identification of the book, by the way, in the Freer painting was done by their curator, Stephen Alley. Next. One painting that we tried to get for our exhibition but failed from the Burrell collection has been published in an old Chinese picture book as a work by Lung Mei, and it could well be his. In any case, it's closely in his style. I knew it long ago from a plate in this old Chinese reproduction book that illustrated paintings of women as seen at right. And this painting gives me an opportunity to touch on another important issue in the study of Meiran paintings, the ways in which the artist, artists who did these paintings adopted themes and compositions from European paintings, which they knew through printed reproductions that had found their way to China. The main theme of this one, for instance, the woman having her hair done by her maid, seen behind a heavy curtain, the open window, the dressing table covered with her cosmetics, can be closely paralleled in northern European paintings of the 17th century, such as this one by the Dutch artist Gerald Dow, painted in 1667. The Chinese artist didn't simply copy, but took interesting themes and good stylistic ideas from the European pictures and use them for their own purposes. The name of the artist Gerald Dow inevitably evokes in my mind the lines from the Major General song Haha <laughs> in Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates of Penzance, in which he sings, I can tell undoubted Raphael's from Gerald Dow's and Zophanes. I know the croaking chorus from the frogs of Aristophanes. Well, we, you know that. Next. When we observe in this anonymous Dutch painting of the 17th century, representing a similar theme to the Gerald Dow, a woman in her boudoir having her hair done up by her maid with her bed in the background, still with rumpled bedclothes, indicating perhaps a night of lovemaking. And then, and then when we see these same elements, mutatus mutandus, in this painting by an artist named Wang Chao, dated 1657, and now in the Minneapolis Art Institute, the correspondences cannot be a matter of chance. The Dutch paintings were not, of course, seen by the Chinese in the originals, as I say, but in lithographic and other prints made from them, which found their way to China in large numbers. They were brought in partly to supply a large demand for European pictorial motifs that could be used in decorating porcelains. The Wang Chao painting is reproduced as figure 1.6, near the end of the first chapter of my vernacular painting book, and as I say, it will be in our exhibition. This is a good place to end part one of this long lecture on Mayoran paintings. The subject will be continued with lots more examples in part two. That ends part one. <laughs>